Teacher, what large stones? They went large buildings. That's what one of Jesus' disciples said as they came out of the temple in Jerusalem. This disciple from Galilee, who had lived there up in the country, was looking at the huge temple that stood there atop Mount Moriah. And he was amazed at what he saw. But the disciples were even more amazed when they heard what Jesus said in response. Jesus said to him, you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. Imagine the reaction the disciples must have had when they heard Jesus say those words. Not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. Is he out of his mind? Is he totally crazy? What's going on with this man? One would have as much problem understanding what Jesus was saying as someone might have said back in 2001, down there in Manhattan, looking up at the World Trade Center and saying, see those buildings? They're all coming down. And people would have said, you're absolutely out of your mind. And yet they did. Jesus' words are hard to understand. There are preachers, of course, who will look at this text and say, Jesus is talking about the end of the world. That's when it's all going to come to an end. And they'll get people up in a frenzy and get them concerned because the end of the world is just around the corner. There was a uh, radio preacher years ago now who uh, picked out a date in September when the world was supposed to come to an end. I guess he was wrong. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is not describing the end of the world. Jesus is talking about something much more important. Because he was talking to his disciples about their future and what was going to happen to them in the days after his crucifixion. But keep in mind that these words are, are not just words of Jesus walking along a pathway somewhere in Galilee. These are words spoken by Jesus to his disciples looking at the city of Jerusalem just days before his arrest, his trial, the condemnation, his beating, and his crucifixion. All of that was about to happen within, say, 24, 48 hours. By the end of the week, Jesus' body would be laying in a tomb. And Jesus knew that. He had told his disciples that on several occasions. And nevertheless, he wanted them to be prepared. He wanted them to be ready because he knew that after his death, after his crucifixion, even after his resurrection, those disciples would have some very dangerous times to face. Indeed, Jesus knew what was happening in Israel. We don't often think very much about it because when we hear the gospel we focus completely upon the context in which Jesus is preaching and teaching and healing but we don't pay much attention to what's going on in the rest of Israel or the rest of the world at the same time but at the same time as Jesus is preaching and teaching and healing in Galilee there are rebels up there in the mountains and they're looking down at the uh, travel paths that are taken by caravans and looking at the Roman soldiers who are traveling along and they're attacking those soldiers and killing them and whenever possible they go into Jerusalem and they stab soldiers and kill them there's that kind of guerrilla warfare going on constantly while Jesus is going about his ministry and Jesus knew it and so Jesus knew what was going to happen ultimately to the temple in Jerusalem Keep in mind that the temple had already been destroyed back in 586 B.C. But now this temple, now that temple would be very hard to destroy because it was the largest temple in the world. The largest temple in the world. When we hear the word temple, we don't think of those terms. We think of a parish church or maybe we even think of something like a cathedral. But Jesus is talking about the largest temple 
in the world in his day. Larger than the temple to Artemis in Ephesus, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. After all, the Jewish people were monotheists. And all those other temples were built to individual gods and goddesses. So I guess if you put them all together, maybe you'd have something really big. But here, the Temple of Jerusalem was devoted to the one true and living God. Built by King Herod. 47 years under construction and still not completed. King Herod, of course, is long gone. He never, he wasn't a Jew, and he never really wanted to worship in the temple. But he did it because it was a politically smart thing to do. But here's his temple. And Jesus is looking at it. And Jesus knows that the day is coming when even the temple will be destroyed. And if that's the case, what will happen to the people who worship there? When we hear about the temple in Jerusalem, we miss the significance of that building that property. Two weeks from now, I will be in Jerusalem with a group of people that are going on a trip that we've been talking about now for a couple of years. And we'll be able to look out at the Temple Mount that was built by King Herod back in those days. That Temple Mount is still there, of course. The Temple is long gone, but the Temple Mount is there. And the stones are huge. The stones might be about as big as those, uh, that entryway to the church from one side to the other. And there's lots of them. It was a symbol of the presence and power of God. And the prophets had long predicted that one day the time would come when all the nations of the world would stream to Jerusalem and go up to the holy mountain. And there is where they would worship. There is a place where they would pray. That's a place where they would make their sacrifices in worship of the true and living God. That place would be a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. It was a place unlike any other on earth. And Jesus said, not one stone will be left upon another. By the way, in the years 65 to 70 A.D., about 35 to 40 years after the crucifixion, there was a Jewish revolt. And the Romans came and they destroyed all of the fortresses built by King Herod during his time. And after destroying the fortress at Masada, after a two-year siege of that fortress, they set their eyes on Jerusalem. And they went into Jerusalem, they destroyed the temple, they ripped it apart, took all the gold, all the jewels, all the adornments that were there in the temple. It was left in rubble. And the whole city was set on fire. They killed people, anyone they could see. Male, female, young, old, children, infants. They killed them all. In fact, the famine that came about was so bad that people even began to eat their own children. The words of Jesus actually came to pass. But Jesus wanted his disciples to be prepared for that. Because Jesus knew that if they were not prepared, that they would be destroyed. And Jesus thought, of course, the destruction of the temple was not really a bad thing. While we are horrified at the account of what took place there, it was true that the purpose of the temple had been lost. That the people of God uh, and the leaders who led them had lost sight of the mission for which God had set them apart in the first place as his chosen people. They were no longer worshiping the true and living God. They were now involved in religion. And religion is one of the greatest enemies of faith. That dangerous future for those disciples was something that Jesus prepared them for. And that's why they were able to survive. It's also the reason Jesus <coughs> tells us the same thing. Because although we may not face the same dangers as those disciples there in Jerusalem back in the first century, there are many Christians today around the world who are indeed in great danger 
and are undergoing great persecution. I get email and uh, Facebook messages from Christians in other parts of the world, and some of those places are just terrible places for Christians to live. No, in our particular context, we don't have to necessarily worry about that. But there's an even greater danger, perhaps. And that is the danger of complacency, the danger of taking for granted the things that we have as people of God and forgetting about or diverting our attention to other causes and concerns that are less important. Good concerns, but less than what God wants us to pay attention to. Good causes often distract the people of God from doing the right thing. Our mission is to proclaim the Lordship of Jesus Christ over all the earth. And that has all sorts of implications for the society in which we live, of course. But unless we know that Jesus is Lord, unless we recognize that Jesus is Lord and proclaim that message to, to the world, nothing we set out to do is going to have any lasting significance. We build temples around the concerns that we probably should not pay all that much attention to. Temples made by human hands rise and fall. They may be beautiful, they may be inspiring, they may demand some of the greatest offerings we can give, but they ultimately fail us. They do not last forever. But Jesus, the one who said, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it up, who is referring to himself, is a true temple for the people of God today. And it is that temple that we need to spend our time proclaiming. For he has made us his temple as well, as the body of Christ in the world. Do you not know that you are the temple of God, St. Paul wrote? and the Holy Spirit dwells within you. Therefore glorify God with your body, he, uh, Paul says. So when you see things happening out there, do not be afraid. They are but the birth pangs of God's new creation. God is bringing about a transformation of the world, and he wants to do it with and through you. Look up, pay attention. God's redemption is drawing near.